Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Kara's Books. And Kara's Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. I'm really excited to be with all of you tonight. We'd love for you to shout out where you're watching from. We're here to celebrate and talk about the Menopause Manifesto with Dr. Jen Gunter. Um, Dr. Jen is regularly referred to as Twitter's resident OBGYN. She is an internationally best-selling author, obstetrician, and gynecologist with more than three decades of experience as a vulvar and vaginal diseases expert. Her instant New York Times and USA Today best-selling book, The Vagina Bible, has been translated into 19 languages. The Guardian calls her the world's most famous and outspoken gynecologist. The recipient of the 2020 NAMS Media Award from the North American Menopause Society, Dr. Jen is a columnist for the New York Times and the star and the star of the CBC Amazon Prime series, Jen Splaining, a video series that highlights the impact of medical misinformation on women. Dr. Jen's TED Talk was one of 2020's top 10 with nearly 3 million views. So we are thrilled to have you here. I'm very honored to be kicking off um, this part of your tour with you. Um, and we're joined by Michelle Cohen Merrill, who is an award-winning health and medical writer based here in Atlanta. Her work regularly appears in Wired, Medscape, Health Affairs, and other pu publications. She's a longtime contributor to Atlanta Magazine, where she has written about racial disparities in COVID-19 infection and a women's long-delayed search for justice after her rape kit was discarded after a brutal assault in Savannah, Georgia, more than 30 years ago. She's also written about a dozen commemorative books for institutions such as Emory University School of Law and the University of Dayton. So welcome to you both. Um, and welcome to everyone watching at home. I want to just let folks know if you have questions, they have answers. Dr. Jen has, has many, many answers. Most of them are contained in this book, which we want you to go home with. You can click this teal button at any time to order the Menopause Manifesto from Karis. Um, but we also do want to get your questions answered tonight. So um, please click ask a question at the bottom center of your screen at any point. It's not disruptive. They'll just be collected here until we are ready to attend to them. So feel free, put as many questions in as you like. If you see a question that's similar to one that you would like to ask, it's already been asked, you can upvote that question so as to avoid redundancy. And finally, um, feel free to, to be chatty in the chat. Um, we want this to, to be as fun as possible. Um, the topic of menopause is one that is often uh, not treated with the, um, the, the fun that it, it deserves uh, and the, the cultural sort of, um, like creativity that I think this book brings to it. So um, I'm excited for um, for everyone who is here to get answers and support um, to kick back and, and enjoy. So thank you both for being here. I'm gonna get out of the way and, um, and welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, ER. Well, um, Dr. Jen, I am honored and privileged to be the one who gets to interview you here today. Um, and I know your book, hit number four on the how-to of the New York Times bestsellers list. So congratulations. Thank you. And, that was really um, exciting. I was wondering, you know, menopause has not been like a top selling concept, uh, something that people, you know, tweet and, <laughs> and post about all the time or anything. So, I mean, do you think that it's coming out of the shadows? Does this reflect sort of a, an untapped, um, you know, thirst for more knowledge about menopause? How, you know, what do you, th other than your brilliance, what, <laughs> what propelled this? Yeah, so, you know, when I was on tour for the Vagina Bible, every single stop, you know, back in the before time when we could actually, you know, go places, every single stop there were questions about menopause. Like, and, and it seemed that once one person asked a question, like a flood of questions came. And it sort of felt like creating a space to talk about the taboo of the vagina and the vulva, which obviously shouldn't have a taboo, but does. Sort of opened a door to talk about the last taboo, which is menopause and an aging woman's body specifically. And I was really taken aback by by sort of the, the thirst for knowledge, this like, like how little people actually knew. They didn't know anything. And this is half the population and it might be for half their lives. And I just really thought a lot about that. And I thought, well, 
that's ridiculous. People need to know more because, you know, as a gynecologist, you know, I knew most of this stuff in the book. So I, you know, you're kind of unaware of what other people don't actually know. Right. And so, so I just thought this is ridiculous. I need to tackle this. I need to also help, help people see where it fits sort of in the cultural spectrum or the evolutionary of medicine spectrum, if you will. And if people pay attention to what I say, if I'm popular in any way, maybe I can get people to start talking more about menopause because it shouldn't be something that we're ashamed about. We shouldn't have a taboo about it. And we only do because of the patriarchy. I mean, after all, every woman is going to go through menopause. I mean, it's not like optional or, you know, and it, it's like not knowing, you know, I heard from, uh, you know, I've heard stories from women whose family was, for whatever reason, they their mother never talked to them about a period and all of a sudden one day they were bleeding, you know? So, I mean, it's like, you don't want it to be something that, I guess, obviously we expect, we don't think we're gonna have our period for the rest of our lives, but to not know what's ahead. And that seems kind of frightening to me. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's almost worse than, than the, you know, the lack of knowledge with menstruation, because yes, many girls, you know, there are, I'm sure there's still girls who wake up covered in blood in, in many places of the world, and maybe even in some places in the United States who didn't know it was coming. But everybody knows they're growing, right? And so, and everybody sees their older sisters and their older brothers and adults, and they know that they're going to become that, right? But there's, because a lot of what happens with menopause isn't physically apparent, um, it can be hidden and covered up. And so there's sort of no idea what's coming, like nothing at all. Like at least when you're a kid, you know you're gonna grow up to be an adult, but there's just like nothing. It's sort of like this veil drops and that's it. And there's not, I mean, not that there's a specific age for menstruation, but it feels like there's a wider range in what year you know, how menopause might occur. Like what would be the earliest that would be considered normal, you know, not, I know there's a special name for early, what's it called, a primary ovarian insufficiency or something? Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, so we used to call it premature menopause, but you know, that's not a fair term to, to give to a 35 year old. Um, and it's also not accurate for some medical reasons, which I talk about in the book. And so we use primary ovarian insufficiency. So yeah, you're exactly right. So, you know, you think about the range of puberty and you think, well, like, you know, nine to 15 or maybe like eight to 13, but, but if you tack on all the developing brain and everything like that, it's probably 10 years, maybe a bit longer, right? Like there's all this work showing like our frontal cortexes aren't really developed for a while. And, you know, we look mature, but we're not. But with menopause, so the, the average age for the last period is 51. But the time before is the menopause transition, which is all this kind of hormonal chaos leading up to it. So there's sort of starting and stopping with the ovaries. Some months your hormone levels can be higher, some months lower, some months none. Uh, and that can start, you know, anywhere from three to four years to eight to nine years before, because there's a lot of variation in symptom expression and tolerance. Some people may notice their symptoms earlier than other people, right? And so we're all different. But if it if menopause, so if they, if, if people go through menopause and they're like done between the ages of 40 and 45, we consider that kind of on the early end. Um, and that's important because the earlier you go through menopause, the shorter your life expectancy. And so knowing well, about it earlier. Yeah. Um, and that's because of heart disease, because menopause increases the risk of heart disease. And so the, the longer you're exposed to that increased risk of heart disease, the greater your, you know, your risk. So, um, and there's an increased risk of dementia with early menopause and also osteoporosis. Um, wow. later, later menopause, so after 51, is associated with a lower risk of breast cancer. Um, but, you know, we, the, the balance is sort of in the the negative favor, if you will, of early menopause because heart disease is so much more common. So I noticed in your book, you said this is the 200th anniversary of the coining of the term menopause. And it was coined, of course, by a man. And even today, 200 years later, we don't really, well, when I say we, I mean the average person, not you, of course, um, don't really know 
what the hell it means. I mean, what's menopause? Is menopause that part where you're having all these symptoms when you're not getting your period regularly? Is it your last period? Is it after? Are you in menopause forever? Or is it <laughs> is it just for a certain amount of time? So there's two ways to think about it. There's kind of the medical way, and then there's the practical, how are you gonna live your life way? And so the medical way actually sounds way more complicated than, than it actually is, but because we have to divide things up in phases for research studies, right? So, and the only hard stop when you ask people a question is their last period. So research-wise, we get a little bit fixated on the last period because it's an actual defined point. We can put a pin drop there. Right, and then we can sort of work backwards from there. So technically, menopause is the last menstrual period. Everything after is postmenopause, and the time before is the menopause transition. But from a practical, how are you going to live your life standpoint, menopause can be all of that because the changes that cause heart disease or osteoporosis or that might cause vaginal dryness, those start during the menopause transition. They don't start when you're postmenopausal. And some of the some of the changes might not start until you're after menopause. For example, vaginal dryness or bladder infections. And so when people get kind of hung up on, you know, is it perimenopause or premenopause, which are other terms for menopause transition, or menopause, they sort of then it's like missing the forest a bit for the trees because medically it doesn't really matter. If you have symptoms, you get treated, right? Knowing that you've started on the menopause transition is enough for us to know your risk is starting to increase. So I think it's totally fair to sort of refer to everything sort of as the menopause continuum or menopause and just use it as like a broad umbrella term. Mm -hmm. And when that guy developed the term, what was he trying to do? Dr. Dr. Dujardin, who I'm determined to go to France, hopefully later this year, because I actually want to see like where his practice was. And I'm in desperate looking for, I'm trying to find um, an original copy actually of the book. I have a, I have it reprinted, you know, from one of those presses that, you know, that printed it off for me. But, and I have a ton of old, yeah, yeah, I do. I have it somewhere here. Oh yeah, here. This is a version of it, De La Menopause. Oh, very, very cool. yeah, because I wanted to read it in book form. Like I was trying to really like immerse myself in this culture. But yeah, I also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my French is, my French so is pretty nice. good. Because well, you're Asian. Yeah. So <laughs> my, I needed an assist. So um, so I had a, a friend who's a French Canadian, French physician. It sort of divides his time between both uh, translate large chunks of it for me. My partner is fluent in French as well. So their French is better than mine. So I um, mean, the Google Translate is actually really quite useful. You can you can copy large chunks and put it in. So, um, so I think, times. <laughs> yeah. but I also have a bunch of also, this is kind of show and tell, but um, I bought a bunch of textbooks from the 1800s that were on oh menopause. Gosh. Yeah, because I really wanted to understand like what people were thinking. So, um, and I found the you know the dissertation, the first guy who ever wrote anything on menopause in the 1700s. I found his dissertation in Latin online. Oh my god, <laughs> that's so cool! So what were I they know. thinking? And they were all men, so they had no yeah. clue about anything, right? What, yeah, they were pretty awful, most of them. Although some of them weren't. You know, like this guy Edward Tilt, whose book I have, like for the time, like obviously now reading it, it's misogynistic. But for the time, it wouldn't have been. It would. Have been actually pretty advanced he you know he actually advanced the idea that not all women suffer he you know in his book he says well women who've had really heavy painful periods often are really pleased to be menopausal so you know so he actually you know actually gave a lot of like non non awful advice but yeah de jardin so he came up with the term menopause i, I don't know my guess is he had like a little clinic he was trying to like come up with a term for, you know, because you know, it's a marketing thing, right? To have, it, <laughs> Even then. I mean, I, yeah, I have no idea. But at the time, everybody called it just um, the climacteric, which is a Latin term for a sort of change or um, or the cessation for a cessation of periods. Uh -huh. So he came up with menopause from menes in Greek, which is for month or the monthlies, and pausi, which is for stop or cessation. So it was menopause, which then became menopause in French, menopause, and um, and then so the pause was always to be stopped. It was never a temporary pause like we think of pause. 
So um, oh, it was right, because, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's because Patsy, or if I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it correctly, that's how Google Translate pronounced it. Um, that Patsy in French um, was became pause, and it, Greek became pause. And so that's how we have menopause. And so I actually think we need, we should be going back to climacteric because it's actually not a gendered term. Before sort of the word menopause came about, climacteric was used, men also had a climacteric because it was sort of phases of life. There was this concept that, you know, you're a child, then you're an adolescent, then you're an adult, then you're an old person, then you're a really old person. Kind of those were sort of like the phases of life. And so the climacteric was one of the phases. So, um, and because it applied to, to men as well, it's, you know, then it can apply to everybody. Then it's not like, oh, only half the population have this awful aging. You know, it's a term for everybody. Um, and so I think, and one of the leading journals on menopause is called, you know, the Climacteric. So, oh, really? yeah. Oh, what well, a right? You're going to start a campaign to change. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, we changed the word premature menopause to primary ovarian insufficiency. You know, it can be done. So we just need to raise awareness about it because it's just, you know, the term was invented by a guy who knew nothing about it, whose book was awful. Like his book, is awful. His advice to women in menopause is don't wear so much blush and don't cover your cover your arms. And women are spending too much time in their menopause at the at their dressmaker and they should be spending more time with their doctor. Like that's literally his advice. Well <laughs> I'm not getting really what the blush and the and the clothes are gonna do for you know menopause, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish it was that easy, right? I'll just right. Get wardrobe. Well, it was basically purity culture. He was like, you know, you're an old lady. You should cover yourself up and act like an old lady. Um, and and his medical stuff is just awful. Like it's really awful. You know, if you're a dude and you work out and shoveling in the field and you hurt your arm, well, you hurt your arm. And if you're a woman and you were 60 and you hurt your arm by doing something, it was menopause. But you obviously. know, when I think about it now, it's like. Um, like so many things in our modern culture and society, it the rules have to get rewritten because society has changed so much. But I mean, one way in which it's changed is that I imagine what was this the 1600s or 1700s or something when he wrote this book? Um, early early 1800s. Early 1800s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, people didn't usually live much past 50, right? 50, 55, 60 would be considered really super old. And of course, that's not old now. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so our whole, we've reframed the whole idea of what older age is. And yeah. that means we have to reframe menopause as well. Right. Well, and you know, the term was invented before they knew hormones existed. Right. So you kind of have to think about like, you know, a term that, you know, it, I mean, it, it's really it's just sort of silly to use something that's from like a bygone time, because the thing that bothers me about it is, you know, that way then. So what? So I have to refer to half my life in relation to when my last period was like my last period is the least interesting thing about me. Mm -hmm. And it then, you know, by saying women are in menopause. And men just age we're we're saying that that we're like defective we're saying that we have this other thing that's not as good or that's different or that ages us differently as opposed to saying well you know what for half the population aging is more complex because there's other changes that go along but we also might only think of it as more complex because we used a male model for so long right if um you know if the model had always been ovaries we might be thinking of people with testicles as being inferior because they're not anywhere near as interesting and complex, right? It's all perspective. Yeah, it is. Um, giving it a name like that does make it feel or seem like a disease or a disorder, but you can't have a disorder that affects 100% of everybody. Then it's it's an attribute. It's not a disorder, you know? I mean, exactly. Yeah, it's like pregnancy is not a disease or being a child is not being a disease, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that, and at least if I can get people thinking about it and talking about it, then that's a good start. Yeah, that is a good start. Well, I saw, I had to ask you about this. I saw a headline the other day um, and it said that um, 
Menopause is going to be the next game changer in the global femtech solutions industry. Okay, so um, estimated to hit 1.1 billion by 2025. So I would just love to <laughs> get your thoughts about uh, what femtech, like what do we what do we need? What devices do we need to manage our menopause? Well, I've yet to see a useful one. So, um, you know, I mean, apart from things that are more, or, you know, sort of the ergon like a more ergonomic vibrator for people who have arthritis or things like that. But that's not that's really I not, what that's not what they're talking about. about. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what I like to call the pink gray tax, right? You know, we have the pink tax and now we have pink gray tax. So we're going to upcharge you for things that have never been proven scientifically, but we're going to tell you you need them. Right. So, you know, I, I actually find the whole sort of femtech industry really disheartening because to me, it, a lot of it is capitalizing on the gaps that we have in medicine, because I can't advise someone about something from a health standpoint if there's no clinical studies. So, you know, when you have venture capitalists running things, they don't want a phase one and phase two and phase three trials. They want their product to go to market. Sorry, I'm just gonna get some water. Um, well, actually, um, I was gonna ask you about, I mean, the, the last time you and I communicated, I was working on a story for Medscape on Vagicel, which was marketing <laughs> feminine hygiene products to teenage, teen girls so that their vulvas could smell like a creamsicle. I know you, ha you haven't forgotten that. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I was reading the uh, the menopause manifesto, I saw that you know you said that it kind of grew out of this long smearing rage that you had been feeling, and um, I'm just wondering, you know, if you could explain what you know what was making you angry. You know, that's a, a different a different aspect of um, I don't know exploitation or or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, you know, you you sort of run what I would call the reproductive gauntlet your whole life, whether you plan on reproducing or not, right? You have to menstruate, you know, or, or take medications to not menstruate, right? You, if you partner, you know, with, um, with people make sperm, you have to worry about, you know, getting pregnant or not, or fertility or not, and you're judged by it. You, you sit on an airplane and someone says, oh, do you have kids? You know, they don't automatically, you know, say that to men, right? You get paid less at work because of that. You get comments when you apply to medical school or what's going to happen if you get pregnant. And, you know, I said, which was you know, a lot of ovaries at the time. Um, I said, well, do you ask the men that question? <laughs> they looked at me and they said, well, no. I said, well, then don't ask me. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I just, well, I was so shocked. I was like, I'm 20. I was, I was 19 when I interviewed. I was very young, you know. I was 19 when I interviewed, and so it was really more out of shock, like about like 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 I'm 19. I'm applying to medical school. What I don't even think you're kid. What do you you know? I so I don't actually think it was sort of like a, a feminist rage. I think it was kind of more just like absolute like just shock. Like like would you know? Would you ask a 19 year old you know boy because they're still boys, you know? Anyway, um, so yeah, so so that you and you get paid less and all of this happens and you just finally, you know, you're not worried about your period anymore. You're not worried about getting pregnant anymore. You know, you're, you're maybe at the age where people aren't gonna be grilling you on airplanes about getting pregnant. And then you have all these new symptoms that come along and a whole nother way to get judged again. And it's kind of like coming all the way around again. And so now you get judged because you're too hot or your hair is gray or because you have wrinkles, you know, it's sort of like, you know, like you get upgraded to, you know, a model that's just going to be, you know, either uh, insulted more, put down more, even paid less, you know, and so it just was like, oh my God, like, when does this end? Like, like, why, you know, and we struggle to find studies to, you know, for example, like women, it's just big heart disease, like women are less likely to get stats. The guidelines are really clear who should get statins for heart disease. These are like life-saving medications for people. And yet women are less likely to get yeah. statins than men. Like what's up with that? Really? This isn't anything to do with your uterus 
or your ovaries, you know, you're not getting your statin, but you know, so like, like really? So, so things like that. I was just like, man, like, can we not be done with that? Like, so, so yeah, that was, that was kind of like my rage and my rage at like people not understanding what's happening to their bodies. Like, like people, you know, I, you talk to people and they, they have no idea what menopause is like none. And then they get victimized. So then you have these Femtech companies or people selling special vulvar washes and, you know, they're just like taking advantage of, um, you know, of these gaps as opposed to, you know, they provide this illusion that they're filling the gaps, but what they're doing is they're exploiting them. And, you know, it's just, it's really frustrating because if you really want to help people, you know, provide some good data, help, help me help people, you know, I mean, but that's not the quickest way to make money. So, you know, fund a lab at a university, start some great studies, be yeah. a game changer. Don't be a, a, a you know, a predator. So let's talk a little bit, because I'm sure some people are wanting to know, let, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the symptoms and what can be done about them. Um, and I want to start out by asking you to describe a hot flush, why you call it a flush and not a hot flash. And I, I was debating whether I should acknowledge this, but um, I did go through menopause, menopause transition, transition whatever, um, but I never have had a hot flush. So it's very unpredictable. I mean, I just want to, from my part, I want to say to women, because I think that's part of the curiosity, right? Like what's going to happen to you? I guess for each person, it could be, you might experience it differently. There's not one way that you're going to experience it. Absolutely. The spectrum is so different, just like pregnancy, right? Like some people have completely uncomplicated pregnancy. They have a nausea, not one, nothing. There are people who love being pregnant, right? There's like people who are like, I love it. It was the best time of my life. I wish I could be pregnant forever. There's people right. who say that. And I had sepsis and almost died. So, oh you know, like you, you have this whole like variation of experiences and that's what menopause is like. You have those variations of experiences. And so, yeah, so the hot flush, let's talk about those. So in America, people say hot flash and I hate that term because a flash is psh, comes and goes and that's not what a hot flush is. It lasts for two to three minutes and it's actually a wave of heat that sort of envelops your body that sort of kind of starts from here and goes all the way up. In the UK, they call it a hot flush. Um, and so I like flush because it lasts a bit longer, but my favorite term is the one that dates back to at least the 1700s in the UK or in England, it would be England at the time. Um, it's called a hot bloom. And it's, and it's really interesting that the textbook I referenced earlier, the guy who wasn't so misogynistic, Edward Tilt, he said that more faithfully represents the experience. But, you know, men have decided to call it a hot flush, so that's what it's going to be. Oh, um, right. Yeah, I mean, and he was sort of like, you know, I'm calling it that because that's what everybody does. But, but he acknowledged that that's a more faithful representation, and it really is. So when, when people have hot flushes or hot balloons, um, what happens is you get this heat that starts sort of here and it sort of, it literally comes up and out your head and out your arms. It's a wave of heat. Um, and you may go red, you may not, you may sweat, you may not, you may have chills afterwards. And so with a hot flush, your brain thinks you're hot and you're not, you're not hot, but your brain controls everything. If you're hot, it's because your brain told you you're hot. If you hurt your toe, it's because your brain told you you hurt your toe. And that's always a weird concept for people, but every sensation is assembled in your brain. So your brain can change any sensation. So your brain is getting a signal of hot and, and it's not. So what do you do when you're hot? You gotta move your blood to your periphery to, to get rid of heat. And so what happens is that amplifies the heat by you get this wave of blood going out to sort of get rid of him because blood is warm. And then you start sweating because that's what you do to lower your body temperature. You weren't actually hot. And that's why then people have chills afterwards because your body temperature does drop because you were dumping heat that you never needed to dump. And so it's faulty wiring um, that's related to some complex changes with estrogen and possibly other hormones. And your experience is not uncommon. 25% of people have minimal to no hot flushes. They just like, their periods stop and they're like, that's it? Oh, okay, 
Um, you know, so, and then there's me who's um, maybe heading into super flusher category. You never really know. <laughs> um, you know, my mother had terrible hot flushes from what I can remember, uh, but you know, you also like as a kid, it's hard to know. You know, um, there were other issues too. So, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm four years past my last period. I'm on estrogen and I still have hot flushes, you know, it's better than it would have been if I'm not on, but, um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes I'm so hot. I, and I'm a really heavy sleeper. I wake my partner up. The heat from my body wakes them up. <laughs> well, a, a good friend of mine, I told her I was doing this. And um, she said, well, am I going to have these forever? She said she's had it for six to seven years now. So, I mean, so, you don't have the symptoms forever, do you? So hot flushes last on average seven years. So average means... Some people can be longer. Um, definitely up to 12 years is not uncommon for well, 25%, the people who are in the super flusher category. So, you know, and I hear from people who tell me that, you know, that they're never heat wise, they're just never quite normal sort of long term. Um, and I think that phenomenon might be understudied, but I can certainly appreciate that. I mean, my temperature control system's just not quite right. It's better than it was a couple of years ago. Um, and so, you know, you just, but yeah, I mean, it's just something to be prepared for, uh, I, which was, you know, wardrobe wise, I was like, oh, I used to wear all these sweaters and now I'm like scared. Um, so I'm getting a little bit more like comfortable doing that now because things aren't as bad. But in the summer, when it's warmer in general is when I have a lot more trouble. You know, I feel like I'm like a heat accelerator, you know, um, and that's not an uncommon experience. Well, I don't know. I think to me, like from a bio—I mean, from a biological point of view—I don't really can't wrap my head around it because women have hormonal variations, you know, their whole, you know, adult from the time of puberty on. I mean, you have your fluctuations during your cycle. You have fluctuations when you're pregnant. Um, you had fluctuations when you first began to menstruate, and you didn't have hot flushes during those other periods. So I don't know. It just seems. Yeah. Oh, so it's not just take. So you know, it's not just the lack of estrogen because otherwise we would have them when we're girls, right? Because we don't have estrogen, you know, in year five. So it's probably to do with you know the brain having a lifetime of being primed with estrogen, right? And then having that estrogen taken away. But you have to remember with menopause, it's not just about the estrogen. There's changes in the brain as well with the other hormone signals. And we're now learning that some of those other hormonal changes may actually drive some of the symptoms of menopause. And then again, there's obviously genetic variation. So, and we don't know everything we need to know about hot flushes. So it's not like we can dissect someone's brain, you know, while they're having it. Because, <laughs> you know, Thank you and because, do that. yeah. And because they're pretty unpredictable, right? Like if I saw, I have a lot of hot flushes, but if I signed up for a study, I can also go four weeks without having one and then I can have a run for a week. So, you know, actually timing and doing the scans at the same time is challenging. And then as I talk about in the book, the hot flushes are never, they're not always what they seem. So people can have these sort of ghost hot flushes where they think they're having a hot flush, but the skin changes don't occur. And people can also have the skin changes like with the blood being shunted, but they don't feel hot. Wow, that's complicated. Yeah. So, and there's cultural things that can impact how people report their symptoms. So, you know, there were studies from the 80s that suggested that hot flushes were far less common among women in Japan versus, you know, women in the United States. And a lot of that was that, oh, it must be due to the soy in the diet or due to the um, cultural acceptance of aging, right? Because you know what? If you're not being told that you suck when you get older, you're, you probably are less bothered by some of your symptoms. It's got to be, right? If everybody's telling you you suck, you probably feel worse. But um, interestingly, um, there was a study done um, in, in Hawaii, actually, of uh, women of Japanese origin and women of, you know, mainland American origin. And what they found was Japanese women were just less likely to report their hot flushes. They were actually physically having them with the monitoring. And so, you know, so, yeah, so we don't know, um, is it even when they're happening, are some cultures just never going to disclose that information, you know, or is it that 
there's something going on brain wise where the flat flushes are happening, but they're truly not registering the temperature. So, you know, I think that that's why we need much more diversity in studies. Um, and uh, also diversity researchers so people can figure out how to capture this information. And I think so the best summary I can give you is it's really complicated. So let's talk about some other effects um, like, you know, the vagina and sexual health and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, should, I hate to say it this way, because it, uh, but should all women expect that they're going to have vaginal dryness? Is that like a thing that everybody has and um you know i know you write in the book about there are a number of different um medical and non-medical ways of addressing that right yeah so vaginal symptoms happen to about 80 percent of women if you sort of look at all three you know if you were to sort of survey people up until kind of like the age of like 80 85 you know maybe but but how much those symptoms bother you are going to depend on a lot of things. So some might be your tolerance. Some might be how much you're sexually active with insertional activities. So if, you, if you're never sexually active and you're never touching, if you're never touching your vulva at all, then you may have what looks like on exam a lot of symptoms, but they not be bothering you. So, so you kind of, have, it's the same way as, you know, there's a lot of men in their 60s who have erectile dysfunction, but if they're not having sex, you know, or they have no desire to be sexy, they don't have a partner, is that, is, how much is that bothering them? So you're gonna have to see like, you know, so it's complex, you have to look at it for each individual person. So um, if you're bothered with dryness, there are lots of treatments. If you're bothered with pain with um, insertional activity, you know, be it, you know, penetrative sex, finger play, oral sex, or masturbation, um, there are really good treatments. So over-the-counter moisturizers actually can work really well. They tend to work best when people just have one symptom though. So dryness or itching or, you know, or, you know, or lack of lubrication. It doesn't mean they won't work if you have multiple symptoms, but, you know, kind of put it in perspective. I always think it's good for people that have expectations about, you know, because if you expect something to treat like 20 symptoms, you know, that might not be the best way to start. So, um, but the moisturizers, and they're really effective. What they are is they're bioadhesives. So the moisturizer sticks to the vaginal mucosa. So it hangs around for several days. And in a lot of studies, the moisturizers perform as well as lower dose hormones. So something to keep in mind, yeah. So, and then there are um, vaginal estrogen therapies. There's a whole range of them from there's pills, there are vaginal pills, uh, vaginal capsules, a vaginal ring and vaginal creams. Uh, and uh, they provide a, a range of hormone levels. And some people say, listen, start with the highest dose because it's awful. And then we can like work our way down and see if I need that much. And other people say, start with the lowest dose and I can work up and see if I need more. And some people say, ooh, I like to start in the middle and then go from there. And so that's the great thing about having different therapies. You know, some people hear about a cream and they're like, oh, that's so messy. And other people hear about a ring and they're like, ooh, I wouldn't want to leave something in me every three months. Then someone else might be like, oh my God, a ring that I don't only have to change every three months, sign me up. So that's why I think it's great to have a wealth of options. And always remember, a medication is not a tattoo. It is easily changeable. So um, so a lot of people sometimes get hung up on, they started with this prescription. What if it doesn't work? Well, then we change it. That's it. It's not, you're not married to it. It's easy to change. Um, so yeah, and there's even a new hormone called DHEA. Well, it's not a new hormone. We all have it in our bodies, but um, a new formulation to prescribe um, for people who don't like estrogen or for whatever reason, um, you know, or prefer that, you know, the feel of that. Some people just, you know, feel is very personal and what some people find feels nice in their vagina. Other people are like, ugh, it feels awful. Um, and we see that like with water-based and silicone-based lubricants, right? Some people like, like I hate the feel of water-based lubricants. Like, I don't know how people have that on their skin. Um, and, you know, and some people hate the silicone lubricants that way. So, you know, um, we all have preferences. So yeah, so those are kind of the standard treatments and there's a whole wealth of them. And um, those the estrogen, especially in the higher doses vaginally, can also help reduce urinary tract infections, which is a common oh, problem. That's yeah. Good. So is your increase with menopause is uh, do you have a higher risk of yeah. um, UTIs? Yeah. Yeah. So around the age of sixty, the risk of recurrent urinary tract infections increases pretty significantly, and that's related to changes in the microbiome from the lack of estrogen, and also changes in tissue integrity from the lack of estrogen, and also changes in blood flow. 
And so vaginal estrogen is, is quite effective at reducing. It's not going to eliminate it, but it's going to reduce it. And so that's going to reduce your burden for needing antibiotics and reduce them, you know, like all the fallout from taking antibiotics and things. So, um, and sadly, we see a lot of people don't get offered that. So um, hopefully, hopefully we, I can help raise awareness about that too. So I wanna talk about a few other symptoms and then I wanna talk about, um, and, and I know we have some questions I'm gonna to try to get to, but um, we'll talk about hormone therapy, but to talk, to just kind of cover some of the symptoms first. And again, they could be some more common than others, right? But um, like brain fog, sleep problems, um, bladder problems, what, you know, so let's start with brain fog. You know, some people might, you know, like, is that a real thing and why? Yeah, so again, it's it's such complicated neurobiology. And if you think about, you know, some people have uh, terrible PMS, right? They get neurological symptoms related to their period and other people don't have any. Like I've, I've never once in my whole life um, ever had a symptom that, ever fits anywhere in the PMS spectrum. Like I have no idea what people are talking about. And I, my office mate um, tells me that she, she has horrible, you know, horrible, horrible PMS her whole life and, you know, feels depressed two weeks before, you know, so I would say we represent like two ends of the spectrum, right? So, so, so our brains are really wired to respond to hormones. And some people seem to respond um, over aggressively, if you will. I mean, aggressive might not be the right term, but, our brains are plastic. They change in response to hormones. And part of that is, um, so when we, the, you know, as we evolved, you think about pregnancy as being this huge biological toll. You spent nine months, devoted all these resources. You've depleted your iron stores. You've done all these things to your body. And now you've delivered this infant that can't do anything for itself. It's like, if you leave it alone, it's going to die. This isn't like a chimp that can crawl on your back and hang on. You, you know, you have to be as a human parent. And, and if you think about it evolutionarily, have been a human mother, you have to become an expert in caring for your child. That's what, that's where your expertise needs to go, evolutionarily speaking. And so that's why a new mother can distinguish cries of her newborn and can distinguish, they can tell, they can, they can tell all those resources that they might say, but I can't remember where my keys are, but they can tell 20 different cries from their baby. So it's not that they've lost intelligence. Resources have been shifted to this most important task, right? And so if you think about our brains like that, that they're, they're, they're built to sort of shift hormonally for survival of the species, that also explains then why it might go awry. So why some people might get severe postpartum depression that sort of plasticity might, for some people it overshoots, right? There may be problems. And so that sort of explains why some people may have issues with brain fog, um, which is kind of like word finding problems or losing your keys, or just like your brain just feels a bit muddled um, because it's like uploading a new operating system. All these hormonal changes are happening. And so your brain, you know, just like if you put a new big program on your computer, sometimes your computer's slow for a while and it's glitchy. It's trying to figure out this new program. And, and that's what's happening. And it's a temporary thing. It's worrying, but it's not medically worrisome. And I think it's a really important thing. It's not a sign that Alzheimer's is around the corner. It's not a sign that you're, you know, you're going to be completely, you know, unable to care for yourself in, in two years or four years or 10 years. It's a, it's a brain fog. And interestingly, women who have brain fog still perform higher than men on memory tests. <laughs> that's great. Well, um, because our because our brains are built for it, so uh -huh. you have to remember that. Like we are, we evolved for this. And if you think about ancestrally, so evolution has been around for tens. Uh, menopause has been around for tens of thousands of years. This is an evolutionary adaptation that um, that we believe helped with survival of the species. If I remember about, I talked about how you have this like incredibly vulnerable newborn having another pair of hands to maybe care for the other children, to gather food, to do other things actually is very helpful. And we have data to show that um, that when people had a grandmother, they were more likely to have more children survive. Right. So it wouldn't make sense for evolution to produce grandmothers that couldn't actually do anything because they were muddled with brain fog. 
afraid that they were completely non-functional without their estrogen, well, then they wouldn't have been helpful. So, um, so there's a lot of research going on in the area. There's, um, you know, there's, but, but people have actually tracked and followed. So if anybody's feeling like their brain isn't working well, they still should be seen and evaluated. Depression can cause brain fog and the menopause transition can trigger depression. Lack of sleep, common in menopause, that can also cause brain fog. So it could be something else. Um, sleep apnea increases during menopause. And so you wanna make sure you have sleep apnea. Wow. So, you know, so you have to, look for everything and then you know you can have a battery of memory tests done and and you can get an assessment and then um you know know if it's concerning or not but but it's it brain fog's not a sign that the end is near so let's talk about um hormone what they used to call hormone replacement therapy um i think you call it menopause hormone therapy in the mm -hmm. book, right? um yeah. i mean in the beginning it was um it seems to me it was sort of touted as like the fountain of youth for women. Like you're going to be, we're going to give you that estrogen and you're just going to be like a young woman for your whole life. Um, and then we had this um, study that was released, the Women's Health Initiative that absolutely terrified everyone. And, you know, if you take it, you're going to get breast cancer. Um, and now we're someplace else. So I'm not sure where we are now. You had some very strong feelings about it that you expressed in the book. So I want you to uh, to tell folks, you know, what what's your, I mean, I know you've emphasized that each woman needs to make these decisions for herself and with the guidance of a physician um, for what works right for her. But, um, you know, if you could talk about what, um, you know, how you'd like to frame this question of whether or not hormone therapy is something that is beneficial for folks. Yeah, so it's a, you know, it, it took a couple of chapters to explain it in the book. So I certainly give you kind of like an abbreviated version, but I'd encourage everybody Everyone who's interested to, to get the book, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, hormones were, um, were dramatically pushed sort of starting in the 50s, and that's because there were oral formulations became available as is. So, you know, people have been using hormones before, but they were kind of difficult and messy and had problems. Um, but once you could give an oral formulation, it became the feminine forever. And actually I have that book, um, which was written in the 60s. I spent a lot of time during my lock my lockdown buying books on Etsy. So this is feminine oh, forever. Right. This is the this is the book that started it, and it sold a hundred thousand copies. I think in the first like five months. Wow, which is pretty huge, right? It was serialized. It was everywhere. Of course, Dr. Wilson, who wrote it, was funded by drug companies, but that wasn't disclosed until later. Um, and wow. so his his idea was that you know menopause was never supposed to exist, and women were all dying in their forties, which we know is not true. And that, you know, women would want to stay feminine forever because the worst thing in the world, it would be unattractive to a heterosexual man's gaze. That's it. There's nothing worse than that. There's nothing worse than having ugly ankles and a tennis skirt, right? So that was this whole book. Um, so, I mean, and, you know, he had, a, he had some good ideas about sex, like people should be able to enjoy sex. Absolutely. But it was all couched with being hot for your dude basically, because that was your worth in society. And then that changed over time to being the fountain of youth, was that estrogen wasn't just going to make you hot. It was going to keep you healthier um, for longer. And that was kind of like the hormone heyday of the 70s, 80s, and, um, and 90s. And we gave estrogen to everybody. You want hormones? You got it. Here you go. Estrogen for all my friends. It was like a party. It was an estrogen party. Because we thought it reduced the incidence of heart disease. And we knew that there was a small increased risk of breast cancer associated with it. That was not unknown. But we felt that because the number one killer for women with heart disease, it was you know worth it. And also protect for osteoporosis. Then the Women's Health Initiative was halted early, which is probably one of the largest randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials that we're ever going to see on hormones. We're never going to see a study like that again. Um, and it was halted prematurely because of an increased risk of breast cancer which was not an increase over what we already knew, right? It was, oh, okay, we found out what we already knew, okay. Um, and that I, it looked like estrogen increased the risk of heart disease. And so that was really revolutionary because we had thought estrogen lowered the risk. The problem is the study was not reflective of the general population. And so the people in the studies were much older. 
than um, than the average age of people who are, you know, when we talk about menopausal hormone therapy. And um, it turns out that when you parse out the data, that the cardiac risk isn't there when you start it closer to your menopause. So if you're starting MHT under the age of 60 and within 10 years of your last menstrual period, the cardiac and you're using transdermal treatments, not oral, the cardiac risk is probably neutral and maybe even slightly improved. Um, but it's not enough improved that that's a reason to prescribe it. But it's not something to be concerned about. For people of average risk, if you're someone who's had two heart attacks or something else, then that's a totally different you know, conversation. But for somebody of you know, average risk, there, there's you know, essentially no concern. The breast cancer risk is there, but it's very low. And so, you know, after people have been on menopausal hormone therapy for you know, three to five years, that risk is about six per 10,000 per women per year. So, and the longer you're on it, that risk may increase slightly. And the risk may also be partly related to the progesterone type medication you need to take to offset the effect of estrogen. So that's kind of a very different discussion. Now, there is a risk of breast cancer, but it's not, it's not zero, but it's very low. But people look at risk in different ways. And so obviously, if you're having no hot flushes and you don't have a high risk of osteoporosis and you're having no symptoms, well, there's no reason to take a medication that you know you don't have any reason to be on, right? But if you're someone who's suffering with hot flushes because quality of life really matters, or you're somebody at very high risk of osteoporosis, then that's a different discussion for you. You know, we're also getting information that suggests that it may, um, estrogen may, this is very controversial, slow some of the loss of muscle mass that we see during the menopause transition. You can also offset that with exercise and may also um, reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes. So, um, and reduce the risk of colon cancer. Uh, so, wow. you know, you have, yeah, so you have to take all, but those risks are not, those benefits are not considered enough to prescribe it. But they're kind of like along for the ride. So, so, so those are things that might sway someone. So someone who's got really bad hot flushes, who's trying to decide between an antidepressant, and there are great antidepressants that can help hot flushes, and menopausal hormone therapy, I'd be like, okay, well, three people in my family have had colon cancer. You know, maybe, maybe I'm actually more interested in hormones. Even though I know that's not a reason to prescribe it, you know, that secondary effect, you know, that's something that's going to make me sleep better at night. So, you know, you have to sort of take it all, you have to take everything in and look at the person in a very holistic fashion. The thing is, is that people are scared by breast cancer. That's what sells headlines, right? Breast cancer, breast cancer, breast cancer. And women don't know that the number one cause of death is heart disease. And I don't want to play disease favorites. I mean, breast cancer is a horrible, awful disease. But the way our press and our public talks about hormones is all in a sort of a state of frightening women away from it. And so what are you supposed to do then? Just suffer with hot flushes for 12 years? Like quality of life matters. And, you know, as I say in the book, women are pretty good at assessing risk. You can look at a dark alley and say, is that okay? Should I walk down that alley or should I go take a bus? Right? You know, so um, is that a bathroom that I feel safe walking to? Look at that collection of dudes standing outside there, you know, or should I go to the next one? Should I get off at this? But like, like, you know, women assess risk all the time. And so I think you should give people the data and they should make their decisions. What they should know is that the compounded sort of hormones are much less safe and they should not be taking those. So, you know, you talked about hormones. I mean, they help with, well, let's see, they, the hormone therapy doesn't necessarily help with vaginal dryness, right? You might still need some. Yeah. So we generally wouldn't recommend what we call systemic menopausal hormone therapy. And we call it that because it's a therapy. It's not a replacement. So that's why the term hormone replacement therapy is not good. Because, you know, we've, we talked a bit earlier about language and how it matters, right? You know, because saying something menopause versus climacteric. Hormone replacement therapy implies you should be on it, but it's a replacement. Um, but, it's, but it's not. I'm 54. My ovaries should not be making estrogen. This is not a replacement. This is a therapy. My son, who has congenital hypothyroidism, is on thyroid replacement therapy. His thyroid should be making thyroid hormone, and it's not. Right. And it's subtle, but it's important because this isn't a replacement. It's a treatment that doesn't make it bad or good. A treatment doesn't make something bad. But 
people who really over promote hormones and there are doctors who it's just like hormones 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 and and they when someone says well, what about these non-hormonal options they say oh you don't want those and a lot of them do that because they're offering scammy tests to check hormone levels, right, which are not needed. Um, but, you know, so it's much easier to sell your product if you're calling it a replacement, but that's not what it is. It's menopausal hormone therapy. So does the um, hormone therapy help with some of these other types of symptoms that we talked about with brain fog, with sleep issues, or even with women who are having some type of depression that has emerged during this time. Yeah, so I, you know, I go into all of those conditions in detail in each chapter, but kind of the summary is, is that it can sometimes help with mild depression, especially depression that starts earlier in the menopause transition, right? So if you're 52 and you know your period just stopped, it's far less likely to be the thing to help you with your depression than if you're maybe 50, 45, and your periods are really irregular, and you know maybe you're a few years away from menopause. So, um, so it may help in that situation. Uh, it will help with sleep if your sleep disturbance is related to hot flushes, right? It won't help. Sometimes people, we also have sort of sleep deterioration with age. And I think it's a really important thing to remember. You know, you, you, you might start your menopause transition when you're 43 and end up with your 52, and you've aged nine years, right? That's not an insignificant amount of time. I always think about what my dad said when he was um, 90. He said, oh, Jen, it's a big difference between 85 and 90. You just you, you feel so much different. And it's true that way. Yeah, I know, right? He's like, oh, it's so different. I was like, but it's true. I mean, at 54, yeah, there's, I, felt, I feel a lot different than I felt at 44, um, you know, kind of age-related. So you just have to remember, like, menopause doesn't happen in a vacuum. So MHD can help with hot flushes that disturb sleep. Sometimes people don't know there it's a hot flush. So you know if you're having really serious sleep disturbance, you still want to get screened by for depression and sleep apnea, and also look at your sleep hygiene um, because you know that can be really helpful too. Uh, and um, it doesn't help with brain fog. So oh, um, it does that's, not. No, that's, that's probably not a reason to. Start we need it. a different pill to help with brain fog. Yeah, well, I think also, too, you know, reminding people that it's temporary because worry makes things worse. Right? Oh, yeah. And also telling people that and, and trying to, you know, reduce stress in general because stress, you know, I mean, like, not like we've been in a stressful time. <laughs> yeah, right. No stress, definitely. Um, someone actually asked about if, is there a difference between night sweats and hot flushes? That she doesn't have something that really meets the definition of a hot flush, but she has night sweats, would that be from menopause? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, other things can cause night sweats too. So um, so just important to always, you know, that's one thing, you know, we we sometimes see this in, and it's not great, but in, in medicine, either everything's blamed on menopause or nothing's blamed on menopause, right? <laughs> so, but you always have to remember that, you know, hot flushes, um, night sweats are, are generally hot flushes that happen at night, that's what they are. Um, and so if you're waking up soaked in sweat um, and you're in your mid 40s or older, then there is a very good chance it could be related to um, the menopause transition or, you know, menopause. And so, but it's always worth reporting to your doctor, you know, thyroid disorders can cause these problems. Sleep apnea can also cause night sweats. So it's, you know, sometimes people wake up and they're all sweaty and it's actually the sleep apnea. So it's always important to have kind of like a full assessment just, you know, just to make sure. Um, and if you have a new onset night sweats like in your 60s, it, that's not going to be menopause. People don't all of a sudden get hot flushes in the age of 60, you know, when their periods have been stopped for years. Oh, interesting. You mean sometimes people might suddenly have a symptom like that that they hadn't had before, but that's not likely to be menopause right. related if they didn't if they developed it long after their last. Well, some are and some aren't. So, um, so for example, vaginal dryness, you bet. You could develop new onset vaginal dryness at the age of 60 totally related to being menopausal. Because for some people, it just takes time for that to develop. But something like hot flushes, no. That's kind of more related to the, it's triggered by the withdrawal of estrogen. And by the time you're 60, the withdrawal's already come and gone. Like that happens. So, so that's not, the triggering event's not there anymore. So it would be really, we would we'd really not want to blame new onset hot flushes in your 60s, you know, on, on your period, you know, on your menopause. And actually, with regard to that, I do want to mention, because I thought 
this was something that I wasn't aware of until I read your book. When you start taking the hormone therapy matters, you said like the age range and the, 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 the point that you're at, it sounds like you don't want to start taking that in your 60s, for example. Right. Yeah, so we do not recommend starting menopausal hormone therapy over the age of 60 or more than 10 years from your final period. Because in those groupings, it does increase the risk of heart attack and also increases of cardiovascular disease and increases the risk of dementia. So we don't want that. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of this middle ground for people who maybe started hormones in their 50s and then they have to decide, should I keep taking it when I'm older or not? And <coughs> hang on one sec. Oh, my throat's a little dry. And we don't have a lot of great data. There's more studies coming out. And so it really just depends on why you're taking it. So, and you can always try stopping it. And if you feel awful, you can restart. <laughs> so my friend that I mentioned, real person, not like, oh, I have a friend. <laughs> but, you know, who had the, who was telling me about the hot flushes. Um, I was actually sort of surprised because she she said, well, what about black cohash? Does that work? And I mean, I she's not her husband's a doctor. She's not the sort who's Googling natural remedies. But I guess she's disturbed enough by the hot flushes that she's been looking around and, you know, Googling to see what. And I know this is uh, this is a hot button because, you know, you you do spend some time in the book talking about supplements and, you know, natural yeah. remedies. And so um, I'd love to just, you know, like get some of your thoughts on that. And I, I, I'll even turn it around and say, you know, are there any natural, not so maybe not remedies, but a, you know, things that would make people feel better? Yeah. So <laughs> it's important to remember that if you're getting a clinical outcome, meaning reduction of hot flushes, you're taking a pharmaceutical. It's just not being called that. It's a supplement. It's having an effect on your body. So you have to remember that. So you should think of any supplement as a pharmaceutical. A supplement's just an untested pharmaceutical. So that's how I tell people to look at it. And the odds are stacked against people wanting to find accurate information. So just like your friend, she went to Google it. You know, these sites, many reputable sites will talk about black cohosh. And, you know, so what that does is that contaminates the Google search. And so basically, there's natural search engine optimization for black cohosh. And all these companies that make it, what they do, you know, you know, as a journalist, all these press releases come out, brand new treatment, right? And so what happens is it's floating in the newsroom and someone writes about it. So now all of a sudden, there's an article about black cohosh in whatever, the Mercury News, some local newspaper. And now that's a valid thing for Google when it's trolling through. And so now there's been search engine optimization. So these these press releases that go out to every single newsroom, you know, across the country, they're just hoping to get five, 10 pickups. And then all of a sudden you've now changed the Google search. And that's something people have to really realize that search, you know, that these companies are fantastic at search engine optimization. So black cohosh, no, I mean, the data is awful. It's not very good at all. Um, it's associated with liver failure. So you, know, <laughs> you, you, you decide if you want to take it or not. And because there's such a wide range of sort of study outcomes and, you know, liver failure seems kind of sporadic and no one really knows, a group of researchers actually looked at black cohosh and found that 25% of bottles in the U.S. for sale with black cohosh don't contain any black cohosh at all. Nothing. Wow. So imagine if every time you opened a carton of milk, 25% of the time it was orange juice. How pissed would you be, right? That would be all over the news. That would be like on the nightly news. Brian Williams would be making fun of like the dairy. That like like people wouldn't accept that. And so think about that, like 25%. And black cohosh is a great example because it's also this part of this sort of our Western sort of exotization of other cultures. So black cohosh is promoted because they say it was a Native American remedy. Well, it wasn't. Native Americans didn't use it for menopause. They used it during pregnancy, but they didn't use it for menopause. So, you know, but you, you attach sort of like, you know, 
um, something from another culture, another religion, another country, you know, um, to it. And then all of a sudden, so that's why we see like with, you know, Eastern remedies and, you know, from all these other countries, or this is from the time of Hippocrates, you know, you, you sort of, you get all these tags that are put on these supplements that are, most of them aren't even accurate to begin with, because, you know, like Gwyneth Paltrow and her jade eggs, those aren't, you know, from China, it, you know, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. You just made that up. So, so you have this sort of, <laughs> ad, you know, this advertising. Well, they did. They just made it up. Like, really, like, like scholars of ancient China, they don't know anything about this, but you do it, Goop. Wow. Like, let's see. <laughs> let's see your research, sweetheart, because I really want to see that. So, you know, so you have you have this sort of setup. So, and then. You People are, believe it, we all mistake repetition for accuracy. Everybody talks about black cohosh. So 25% don't contain any black cohosh. And you know what they contain? They contain a plant from China. Guess where black cohosh grows? It only grows in North America. So they're purposely oh, adulterated. Yeah. yeah, so that it's not like somebody accidentally picked the root next to it when they were harvesting it and made like an honest mistake they shouldn't have made. But no, these were purposely adulterated. They were a plant that's not native to North America. So, you know, so come on. So yeah, so so that is a great sort of springboard to talk about why supplements ca can cause liver failure. So sometimes it causes liver failure because it's black co-wash. We don't really know, it's untested. But sometimes it's because they're adulterated, right? So your supplement that helps your hot flushes could be helping your hot flushes because it actually contains estrogen or it might contain a designer steroid. You don't know. And I think that's a really important point. And that's why it's really hard sometimes to study these things because the lot that's used in a study may not be the same lot because they're made, you know, because they don't have quality control, because some things may be adulterated somehow. You can't even like say like you can't replicate it. So so yeah, so black cohosh, I wouldn't take it. Um, you know, so the only two things that are quote quote natural, and again, the studies are low quality, but there's probably no reason why it would hurt you, unless again it's contaminated and then it's buyer beware is a supplement called S. Equal, which has phytoestrogens in it. Um, and there have been some pretty good studies looking at super high doses of phytoestrogens and they don't seem to cause any problems. So Can you say the name again and for people S. Equal. It's in the book. Okay. And then there's and then there's another thing called relicin. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and it's some kind of like pollen extract. Um, that is supposed to help as well. There's only one study. It's a low quality study and it showed some benefit. And there's probably no harm to that, again, as long as it's not adulterated. So, mm -hmm. you know, I can walk into the factory where my estrogen patch is made and pull a patch off the line, and I know it contains exactly the hormone that it claims. And that's what you get when you have FDA oversight. And I, my, personally, I believe that every supplement should be subject to the same regulations as pharmaceuticals. That would totally get rid of a lot of the junk on the market. And, you know, supplements are the number one cause of medication-related liver failure. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. So, you know, so those are the two things. Um, you know, there's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy can be very effective for hot flushes, for insomnia, for overactive bladder. It's more effective for overactive bladder than medication. Um, so, you know, and again, because that's everything that you feel starts in your brain. And cognitive behavioral therapy strengthens inhibitory pathways. So... Um, you know, well, yeah, I always like to explain to people, so if you stub your toe, your, your brain gets what's called the nociceptive signals, the signals that, that could become pain and assembles it into pain. But that's not where the pain cycle stops. What then happens is your brain has impulses that go back down to shut the, the, the receptors off because it doesn't need to know, and that depends on the injury, right? Like if you've got a broken bone and your leg is sticking out, then, then the inhibitory pathways aren't gonna help too much. But if it's a minor injury, then it shuts it down. And again, think about that from an evolutionary standpoint. If we were all occupied with our minor injuries, we could really do too much. A major injury needs to really stop you. And so what cognitive behavioral therapy does is it strengthens inhibitory pathways a lot of times. And so you're, and that doesn't mean it's in your head or you're making things up. It means that your brain is an incredible supercomputer and you're trying to just strengthen certain programs. Wow, that's awesome. Um, someone asked what I think is a really great question um, and, and kind of a, a good one towards the end of our conversation. Um, you know, you were talking about um, how menopause 
was has made women feel like you know well now you're not worth so much to society anymore you know you're you're old you're you know you're menopause or whatever um to maybe if you could talk about any role models that would come to mind of because there actually are you know and i'm not saying this isn't true for for men as well but you know there are women who've done some of their greatest life work after they did all their child rearing after you know they had raised your family and after menopause right. so um it's not you know in terms of creativity and even productivity and so forth it's not at all a mark of the end right absolutely yeah i mean look at hillary clinton i mean in you know, she's the Secretary of State. She ran for president. She's every time I hear that woman speak, I think you are like the most prepared human. Like there's like, how do you read all? Like how do you like your brain is like amazing. So you know, I think of her. I think I think she's an incredible, incredible person. Um, you know, I think of um, uh, oh. Um, do I think of? I mean, I, there's so many amazing menopause researchers who are in menopause themselves. All these incredibly smart physicians, you know, who, um, you know, whose work I had the pleasure of reading, you know, to do this, um, to write this book. I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? Um, you know, I think of Helen Mirren. Um, man, she is something else. I mean, and she was obviously like, you know, her talent you know, precedes her menopause clearly. But I'm really, so what I'm super excited about, I'm super excited about Fast and Furious 9 <laughs> because she's in it. And I would encourage everybody to watch the trailer because there is this scene where she's like, I think she's wearing this like white, like mink coat and her hair is just like white. And they're just like leaning into this, like just like hot 70 year old. And, and, she's, smo and she's owning it. And she's almost got this like little dominatrix talk to her voice. And she's in the car with this younger man who's driving some sports car. And there, there's cars coming at them and they're being fired. And she says something snotty, like do something about this car or something. And so he slams the brakes or something and turns the car. And she's got, she pulls out these two massive guns and puts her oh arms God. out each window and it kills the, the people in the cars on either side. Oh my God. And I, I totally have to see that. <laughs> I was, I, honestly, I was so empowered seeing that because, you know, we're so used to seeing a man sees Captain America and every man thinks he's Captain America. They all think they have superpowers, all this. And women see like Wonder Woman and we think, oh, well, wow, she's amazing. But, you know, like it's, you know, she's, we don't, I don't think we sort of, and I think it's because, you know, seeing incredible women doing incredible things in movies, like, jumps and fight scenes and things like that is not as common. It's becoming much more common now. And so I look at that and I go and I think, whoa, I want to see so much more representation like that. Because when you see women who are older in the movies or in television, you know what? They're either the mom, the bitchy mom, the bitchy grandma, or they are dying of cancer, or they're, they're like an uh, old lady detective. You know, or they're like the nasty <laughs> matri or they're the nasty matriarch, right? Like, like there's only so many roles they give to older women. And you know what? I've thought a lot about this. When you see women die in the movies, they never die of things. They never die of heart disease. This is the number one killer of women. They die of breast cancer. They die of you know intimate partner violence, or they die of tragic deaths. Men get to die of heart disease, but women don't. And so, even how we die is a like that's part of that has to affect like how we perceive our risk of heart disease, right? You never see it reflected back. Art is so important. Um, and so, yeah, I want more books with crazy, amazing women um, in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s doing things. I want to read more history of amazing women. I want to see them in the movies. I want to see more women like kicking ass, uh, you know, doing incredible things on screen. So I think- and, uh and not 80 year old actresses who are like had their faces rebuilt so they look 30 or something like that you know well you know men are allowed to age in ways that that women just aren't and you know i'm all for people doing whatever they want to do if it makes you feel good then that's awesome that's great but 
I just think that when men are not held to that same standard, it's really problematic, you know. But again, think about it. Think about that industry where a 60-year-old man can be married to a 25-year-old in a movie and that's considered normal and a 35-year-old tries out for that role and she's too old. Yeah, well. Right? <laughs> or my personal favorite, I mean, think, I think I'm right on the age, Sally Field played Tom Hanks' mother in Forrest Gump, and they're the same age. Wow, wow. Or they're like one or two, like it's ridiculous yeah. how close they are in age. And so like, while all of that happens, what chance do we have? Because you know what? If you're someone who partners with men, that's what they see as normal, right? All the imagery they see is normal. You know, so I think it's like, it really plays a number on you. Um, I mean, during the pandemic, I let my hair go gray. And I was like, you know, I'm, I, I used to have this gorgeous honey blonde hair, which is not my natural color either. I actually have dark hair. But, um, you know, California, I was like, yeah, you know, it's really <laughs> leading into the California lifestyle. And it was really hard for me to go, like I was like really agonizing over going gray. And what did that say here? I'm supposed to be this like feminist. I'm writing this book about menopause, and yet I'm like oh, crying to my partner. My hair is so gray, and he's like, "Well, do something about it then, or stop bitching about it. It's your hair, but why do you care what anyone thinks? I think you look good." And I was like, "Yeah, why did you know?" But it's really hard because when all the images are presented to you, it's hard not to internalize it. So. You know, so yeah, so I'm gonna let my hair go super long and super gray. <laughs> you be the change you want in the world, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, I want to give you a chance to do a little shout out for your new podcast. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, everybody, go to your phones, download, uh, subscribe to Body Stuff, which is my new podcast with the TED Audio Collective, and it's all super fact checked. And if you have uh, never worked with Ted, which I have, they are amazing fact checkers. So, um, so every single thing that we say has been, you know, absolutely vetted. And it's a tour through your body. Um, we have eight episodes, and we already covered the kidneys and thirst. That's kind of one one episode about water. We've covered the colon, uh, which we talked about poop, and we just did menopause last week. And here's the coolest thing. I got to interview Dr. Kristen Hawks, who is the woman who started the grandmother hypothesis. It was her research that was foundational for that. Oh, wow. And it was so empowering to talk to the woman who's, I used a ton of her work in my book. And if you want to hear something super empowering about, you know, about women doing research um, and doing research to advance the what being an older woman means to society and how valuable that is. Um, and then the new episode drops tonight and it's all about bones and bone health. And I'm gonna take you from uh, ancient Europe to uh, the steppes of Mongolia to Greenland. And you're gonna learn how we co-evolved with dairy as well. Wow, that's a big issue. Yeah. So cool. yeah, so, um, so please subscribe. It's the number one health rated podcast, which tells me that people actually want accurate information. And here's a secret. When you like do anything with the TV or other people, producers want you to do what they think the audience wants, not what the audience might really want. They also want to produce what they can get sales for, which would be like supplements and scammy stuff. And so, you know, the opportunity to work with Ted was like, we're going to give people actually really cool, good quality information. And, um, and uh, it's like med school Jen Gunter style. And there's, it seems like a never ending. I mean, I know I'm a health journalist. There's, it's never ending. There's always something more to say about what we've learned about the human body and about how to be more, you know, healthier. So. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, it's the human body is super cool. And, you know, what you learn about it shouldn't come from, you know, Instagram and our schools do a bad job teaching about the body. And uh, I just think my whole mission is, you know, whether it was with the Vagina Bible, the Menopause Manifesto, with blogging, you know, right for the times, the body stuff, is if people just had more information, if we could elevate, you know, if we could kind of raise the watermark for the level of medical knowledge, be better for everybody. 
you, you would understand more about your body. You wouldn't feel like there's something just weird happening to you and not other people. You'd be better able to have conversations with your doctor. You're, you would also then know when you're getting bad information. You'd, you'd, you'd have a, a much better ability to kind of work the system. You know, it, maybe it's not going to be good for all insurers or pharmaceutical companies, but that's too bad. Well, it's been great to talk to you. And yes. I appreciate the comments and questions that people had. Yes, thank you so much to both of you. Um, I want to let folks know you can buy the Menopause Manifesto as well as the Vagina Bible um, straight from Karis Books and More by clicking this teal button. And uh, Dr. Jen, I have to tell you, we Karis moved in 2019 and um, the Vagina Bible was the first piece of mail we received galley for that book so it was very we were like look at this perfect um so christening the bookstore with a vagina it's awesome <laughs> uh we got a big kick out of it and what was even more funny was that it was um it was addressed to our dog who wh whose name is jasmine i think because she has staff picks i think the lovely publicist just like sent was like trying to send books to different staff members and maybe didn't realize that jasmine was a dog so <laughs> Uh, it was pretty great all around, and we've never forgotten it. So that that implanted your your name in our brains forever, forever awesome. more. That's so great, I love it. <laughs> yes, um, but we have sold many copies of that book since then. Um, and I want to let folks know if you do order this book from Karis um, tonight, we do have signed copies at the store. So um, we would love to get you a signed copy um and get the rest of your questions answered so um i will be adding captions to this and putting it up on our youtube channel within about 36 hours usually so keep an eye out for that our youtube channel is just um youtube.com backslash kira circle we'd love for you to check out our whole range of events there we also have a bunch of wonderful um pride programming happening um on crowdcast throughout the month of June. So please come back if this is your first time here. And if you enjoyed today, um, Kara Circle is a nonprofit. If you do really appreciate any donations of any size um, to help us continue doing this work. So um, thanks so much to everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Jen. We really, really, really appreciate all of your thorough fact checking and great, great, great information. Thank you, Michelle. We appreciate your wonderful um, you know, questions tonight and leading this conversation. Um, and do you want to shout out where folks can find your work online or on Twitter or anything like that? Um, well, I do have a website. It's Michelle Merrill, Michelle with one L, Merrill, M-A-R-I-L-L dot com. Awesome. Thank you. So go check out Michelle. Um, and I hope that y'all stay safe and well, and that maybe one day we can gather physically in the space of Karis in the future. But until then, um, this has been really lovely and very grateful to you both. Great to see Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. And it was nice to meet you face to face, Michelle. Yes, it's great. And good luck with the rest of your tour. Thank you. And thank you so much again. It was really a great evening. Thank you so much for taking your time out.